The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning, and <laughs> can you hear me? Good morning, and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. It is Wednesday. What is it? It's the 3rd of August. It's 2022. I'm so excited and grateful to be here with you guys today for so many reasons, and uh, not the least of which is that we're going to talk about diet today. And, and this is a subject that, despite how I look, is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm already saying good morning to Michelle and to Laurie. Uh, so thrilled that you guys are here. We are live right now. There's Susie. Hi, Susie. Uh, we're live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, Twitter, and about a dozen other sites. Later on, this show will be available as a podcast. We want to remind all of you that when you're downloading us, it's a free download wherever you get your podcasts. We are the number one rated autism podcast. And that's all thanks to you guys. Thank you for liking and sharing and letting other people know because that's how. Oh, good morning, Anna. So thrilled that you're here with us. I uh, also want to let you know that the podcast did change a little bit recently. For those of you who are watching or listening, um, we always used to podcast both in video and audio, and we recently started just podcasting in audio. So if you want the video, we're asking you to please head over to YouTube, to our YouTube channel. It's still Autism Live, so it's youtube.com slash Autism Live. And our full library is there, 11 years worth of videos. So if there's a subject that you want to get more information about, you can just head over there, search around, poke around. You'll find some really good stuff there for 11 years. Oh my goodness. Uh, it's It's been a trip, right? It has been an absolute trip to be in the front row of all of this and have all the experts that we've had on and, and to get to know all those things. But that brings me, uh, we're going to switch over my mic again. We're, we continue to have issues. So hang on a second, you guys. We're going to you who have been uh, watching the last couple of days. I don't know the, um, my microphone does not, I don't know whether something has changed, but we're going to that phone and switch to the other microphone. So hopefully, um, okay. Let's, uh, let's see if that's better, Traven, and tell us if that is better. So in any case, um, we're, what I was saying is that we have lots of experts to come on the show, talk about lots of subjects. Uh, I'm not an expert. And, and yet I'm going to be the person giving the talk again today because this summer we've been doing a series called Parent to Parent uh, where I just tell you what I know about certain subjects in a, in a parent manner to help you to be able to make steps for it. Part of the reason why we've been doing this, as you may know, I, I, I just uh, had my book published that's Autism Parent to Parent, where I talk about a bunch of these things as well. But we also wanted to cover these topics on the show. So uh, good morning, Mary. I'm thrilled that you are here. So as I'm doing the talk, if you guys uh, want to be writing into the chat with specific questions, but remember, this is my disclaimer that I'm not an expert. Um, I'm not a dietitian. I'm not an expert in autism. I'm somebody who has been interviewing people for more than 11 years because before this, I was doing my own radio show, Everyday Autism Miracles. And I'm a mom who has been on this journey. I, I, I identify myself now as a pony, a parent of a neurodiverse individual. And actually I'm a pony, a parent of a neurodiverse adult individual. So, uh, and we had experience with diet and I've also, as I said, interviewed many people and talked to so many parents over the last almost 20 years. Uh, and, um, you know, I've been thrilled to be able to do that. So I'm just sharing you like the cliff notes of what I learned along the way that has been useful to me so that you can go and if you say, hey, now that makes a little bit of sense to me, I guess I'm going to go do research on it. But Shannon will tell me what, what words to research, like, and where to go to buy the thing that's going to help me uh, to be able, if I decide that I, I'm not going to feed my child gluten anymore, where's the bread? Shannon, where, where, 
which bread aisle are you in? How are you making a grilled cheese woman? Right. The things that we really need to know. So, but write in uh, if you have questions about anything in particular, because I think that this is a dicey thing when we're talking about diet food is important to all of us, right? And we want our food the way we want our food. And we're all a little bit like, don't take my food away, right? And why is that? It's a primary reinforcer. That's what the behaviorists will tell you, that we're that it's, it's one of those things that it's so reinforcing. If you're eating something that you like, it's super duper reinforcing. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, okay, we apologize. We're still getting a pop on our audio and we don't know why. Um, so Trayvon's going to continue to work on that, but I apologize in the meantime. Okay. Um, but I did mention, I'm not an expert, so let's head right into this. We're not even going to do jargon today because there's so much jargon around the diets that we, we don't want to make your heads explode. Right. Uh, so, so the, here's the big question. Why is diet so important for individuals on the spectrum? Why is this a thing? Why do so many people talk about this and why are some people so fatutzed about it? Why do behaviorists in particular, not all behaviorists, why do some behaviorists get all squishy about this and say, oh, we don't talk about this. This doesn't exist. This is, you know, made up um, that the diet is important in terms of autism. We're going to take on all of that here. All right. Uh, so first of all, let's, let's start with what I call duh moments in history because you know used to be that we and we still cover news stories here on autism live and and we would read research like you know putting ketchup up your nose is not uh, a good thing and and to that yeah i'm making that up um but i remember a couple of years ago they spent like another million dollars on people smoking when they're pregnant and that it was not a good thing for them and i remember going duh like, why are we spending money on these kinds of studies? There are some things that just seem common sense to me, and yet other people need studies to confirm them. Okay, so studies are done. Um, and, and studies have been done in terms of diet. But here are two duh moments. that There have been a great deal of research on these, but I think we can now safely establish these two things to be truth, that what you eat affects how you think and behave. Now, this should not be a hard climb for most people, but I will tell you that there's a lot of great behaviorists that are out there that for years and years and years said, well, you know, behavior is behavior and it's not different dictated by what you eat. And they clung to that. And I don't know whether it was a little bit of telephone tag, because honestly, you know, when you used to play the game telephone when you were kids and somebody would whisper into somebody's ear and then they whisper and then it would get around to the last person and you would say what it was and it had changed from chocolate chips to googly gawk. And everybody would go, you know, how could that happen? Because in the retelling of it, it gets messed up. And I think, I suspect that where behaviorists are concerned is that in the beginning, as they were, you know, making their science to be something uniform and, and becoming board certified, that it was very important that they stick in their lane and that they not give advice about things that they weren't experts about. I think we can all appreciate that and go, that makes a certain amount of sense. And that they not espouse things that weren't scientifically proven. Well, that means you don't go out and, and, and say things that don't have science to back up, but instead, in the telephone tag of it, uh, what happened is that behaviorists were told, so don't talk about diet. There, you, it's not your lane and there's not enough research about it, right? But what that became is people saying it's a, it's a myth. Don't do it. It has nothing to do with it. And, and of course, now the research has been done, but there still seems to be this, this thing that sticks around with behaviorists that they're like, oh, the diet thing has nothing to do with autism. Well, okay. The diet thing has to do with everyone. So what are you saying? Because we all are affected by what we eat. I always think about my Aunt Mick. When I was a kid, my Aunt Mick at a family re reunion, she said, well, I like onions, but onions don't like me. And I remember thinking as like an eight, nine, 10 year old going, what the heck does that mean? What it like? How can onions not like you? And of course, as I grew up, I met other people that they were like, "Yeah, I don't know why my stomach just can't handle onions." Well, my stomach can. 
So are we saying that all people, uh, all people's stomachs can handle onions? Are we saying that all people's stomachs can't? It's not true. Some people can handle, and we're not saying onions are bad. We must ban all onions, right? Some people can't handle onions. And if they eat onions, you bet their behavior changes and the way they think and react in the world changes because if they've eaten something and, and they don't feel well, you're going to change how you think and you're going to change how you behave. I call that a duh, y'all. I don't <laughs> like... I don't, I don't know what to say for people who don't understand that. The other example is, you know, if you say that what you eat and drink doesn't affect your behavior, then try only drinking beer today. And let's see if your, your thinking patterns and your behavior ch patterns change. They're going to, right? Um, or, you know, there's any number of things that people talk about. Oh, you know, I... I decided to go vegan or I decided to add red meat into my diet and I feel better, right? Everybody is different. But what you eat does have an effect on how you think and behave. It's just that sometimes it's so minimal that we don't notice it. We don't really attend to it. There are people who don't have food allergies, who don't have food sensitivities, and they will tell you, oh, you know, food doesn't affect me. And yet if you look closely, they have foods that they like and foods that they don't like. And they have times that they eat and times that they don't eat. They figured out how their ecosystem works with food. And I, you know, those, those same people who are like, I can eat anything. I've got an iron stomach. It doesn't bother me. You take them on vacation and suddenly their schedule is a little disrupted or they eat a little bit more fiber than they're used to. And they're like, I don't know, I got a little bit of a tummy thing. And you go, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, so I don't, I don't buy it. Uh, in any case, uh, so hi, Dark Angel, good morning. They say, I didn't know my son had high oxalate. And last month I gave him low oxalate foods and he doesn't cry anymore every 30 minutes after he finishes eating. This is part and parcel of why we have this conversation. Because as we grow into adulthood, we start to see what are the patterns. Because um, when you're really not feeling well after eating something and it happens repeatedly, you start to notice as an adult and you go, you know what, I guess I just can't eat onions anymore. If you're like my Aunt Mick and it's just not worth it. Right. And we start to adjust our eating habits so that we can live our best lives. Why would we leave people on the autism spectrum out of that? Why? Why would we do that? That to me is crazy. Right. And if we see kids that are holding their stomachs, having difficulty learning, why would we leave them out of this equation? And we need to, but, but part of this discussion is based in the fact, the second fast, that fact that no two children are exactly alike. I, you can say, yeah, but they both have autism and you and I both know it doesn't mean a thing, right? Um, that there are some kids who can eat certain things and other kids who can't. That's life that doesn't really, you know, it's not exclusive to autism, right? But if we're looking at things that way and we want for the people in our lives who are on the autism spectrum to lead the best lives that they can, then it behooves us to look at diet, right? I think that that makes great sense. I hope you guys are with me so far. And that's why we're going to talk about this. But there is no absolute, you know, don't, don't, don't do this diet and this person on the autism spectrum will, you know, automatically be able to know trigonometry or automatically be able to socialize and have skills that they previously did not have before. That is not what anybody is. Well, some people are saying that. I'm not saying that. So I made a list of some of the more well-known diets that are here so that if you want to go and look up these diets that, you know, you know what you're looking up. So first of all, GFCF, which is the gluten-free casein-free, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. But then there's the GFCF SF that includes being free of soy. So it's gluten-free, casein-free soy, and we will talk about this more, but gluten is a protein in um, grains, most particularly wheat, but it's in other grains as well. Casein is a protein in milk, and um, soy obviously is a protein, right? 
so, um, oh, Tabitha, uh, I, I so appreciate your comment. She says, I, I thought this would have been something discussed with our pediatrician right after our daughter received her diagnosis. Amen, sister. But um, that if you told me that that did happen, I would probably lay down on the floor and have to be resuscitated. I will tell you that, uh, not to get too sidetracked, but I don't know at what point in the medical profession they decided that they were just going to make nutrition a one-day lesson while these people were uh, in medical school. Um, because what it's mind blowing to me. I've tried to explain this to my husband a million times, but you know, when he truly got it, when I was pregnant with my son, uh, I have heart arrhythmia issues and I, I was pregnant and having heart arrhythmias and I was over the age of 40. So, you know, it was a five alarm fire and they took me to the hospital and, uh, you know, they were running all these tests and they made the decision that they had to keep me overnight for observation just to make sure everything was okay with me and with the baby and, and that it wasn't too much stress on my body to be pregnant, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So I said, oh, well, okay. I, I, I said, all right, I'm going to stay overnight. I said, but honey, you're going to have to run to the store and get me uh, some stuff for dinner because I won't, I won't be able to eat here at the hospital. And the ER doctor who was standing there and she was like, what, what are you talking about? We have a full kitchen we can get you something. And I said, no, I'm allergic to wheat. It's really hard. Cause remember this was 20 years ago. And, um, now, you know, it'd be a no brainer at a hospital, but 20 years ago, it was not at a hospital. And I knew that. And I said, no, I'm allergic to wheat. So, and she said, no, it's fine. We'll, we'll get you a sandwich. And, and I said, no, because gluten-free bread wasn't available everywhere. I said, no, I, I you have gluten-free bread? And she was like, what are you talking about? We have white bread. And, and my husband, who has always said to me, no, doctors know about these things. What are you talking about? They learn it in med school. My doctor said to the ear doctor, she just told you she's allergic to wheat and you want to make her a sandwich? And the doctor was like, yeah, but we have white bread. And my husband said to her, what do you think white bread is made of? White? <laughs> what? And it was this big moment where he was like, oh, you're right. Doctors don't know about nutrition. Um, it's not their thing. Doctors have gotten so specialized and you would think that pediatricians would be really up on diet for kids. They're not. It's unless they decide. And I'll tell you what happens when they decide to go down that rabbit hole. They, they specialize in it. And then they're not pediatricians anymore that are seeing why they end up being doctors that are like MedMaps doctors. And because they've taken the time to specialize in it. So it's a disappointment, Tabitha, but we hold hands, we get through it together. And it's why I love Taka because Taka has all this information on steroids, more than you could possibly ever use unless you want to become a nutritionist who specializes in this. But remember, I'm just giving you the basics of what you need to know so that now you can search for what you want. So we have gluten-free, casein-free. We have the gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free. There's the fine gold diet. The fine gold diet was really popular when my son was little. And I will tell you that we went on a modified fine gold. And later I will tell you why, but we didn't do the whole fine gold. It was uh, way, 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 way too much for us. Uh, there's the specific carbohydrate, the SCD diet. And we did do a version of that for a little while as well too. The low oxalate, which a dark angel was just talking about the ketogenic diet, which is very specifically um uh, something that if you do start to talk to doctors who deal with seizures and epilepsy, I think you will, it's gone mainstream enough. I think you will hear them say, Hey, have you tried the ketogenic diet? Because a lot of people have found that it's very successful at helping to um, stop seizures. So there you go. Then there's the GAPS diet. Um, hopefully we'll have a second to talk a little bit about that. I will say that a lot of times and, and we've had the creator of the GAPS diet on the show before. I get a little twitchy about the GAPS diet only because it's super hard to do. I personally have done it um, 
I didn't stay on it for the two years that they recommend. It's really hard. I, we want to talk about life changing for people. It's life changing in terms of how you spend your hours. Ooh, maybe a little bit easier now because you can buy really, it's very expensive, but you can buy organic bone broth. Um, but I will say that sometimes some people with the GAPS diet will make claims that it can reverse a diagnosis of uh, many things, including autism. And, and I just always like to be clear, again, diet can set you up for success for learning, but changing your diet doesn't automatically teach you things that you did not, skills that you did not have before. I always like to give that disclaimer. There's the body ecology diet and of course the rotation diet. There are more diets, but this is sort of like a encapsulation of what's been the most popular um, in the last, and, and, you know, I, it's possible that there's new ones that in the last year that I don't know. Um, but you can find all of that by going to talk at TACA now.org. We'll give you that website on the PowerPoint in a little while. So I don't know about you just looking at this list overwhelms the Hey, Nani, Nani out of me. I go, what? I don't get it. Um, Steph says my son had gastrointestinal issues and ended up at the hospital, had to cut dairy for a long time. Yes, because if you are eating something that you're having a reaction to, it's so sad to me that we will see kids who are having intense behavior issues, intense tantrums, um, and, and it's just tearing apart the, the family because they don't know how to keep the kid, the adult, even safe and keep everybody in the home safe. And it's really that, that you know that kind of autism that we all need to be talking more about where it's just really hard to have any kind of a moment where you can say we experience joy today. And a lot of times, not all of the time, but a lot of times when we get good medical care for that individual, what we come back with, what we hear from the, the gastrointestinal person is that they have ulcers all throughout their intestines. And I don't know about all of you, but that just makes me want to put my head down and cry to think for those, for that family, for those, the, the caregivers and the parents and the, the siblings and for that individual, how much pain have they been in for so many years and they've been acting out as a result of it, right? We see this a lot, you guys. If you have a kiddo who is struggling, um, you know, don't be afraid to push, push, push to get the medical care. And you're going to have to push uh, to be able to get a, get a great gastroenterologist to look at your child's colon. It, you know, you it's a, it's a full time job. Let's be honest. But when you get there, it can make such a difference. And in fact, that's what Steph just said, made such a difference with behavior and knowing that dairy does not work well with him. I always tell the story about in, in cause I'm allergic to milk. I was allergic to milk as a child. Then I got to the point where I could, my body could handle it because I didn't have it for so long. And then I ate so much of it that I'm allergic to it again. Mm, I hate that because I love dairy. I could, I can eat you under the table in, uh, like full fat Greek yogurt. Oh man, that's my jam, right? Can't have it. Can't have it at all. Um, cause it just is not good for my ecosystem. And I'm probably never going to be able to have it again. Wow. But I feel better. Right. But I always think back to in the eighties, there was a talk show host, Phil Donahue. And uh, only those of you who are old will remember him, but he had a daytime talk show, very, very popular. And they did this very controversial thing where they were talking about dairy allergy. And they had all these kids in the studio and they were showing them the kids were like sitting politely. They were playing, they were doing whatever. And then they said, okay. And they pulled out all these little cartons of milk and they said, we're going to give these kids these cartons of milk. And then we're going to come after the commercial break to see what's going on. And the terrible thing is, and it's really unethical, but it was a great teaching moment for me and many others. Um, but they knew that those kids were reactive to milk. And they were making a point. And so they gave the kids milk and they came back and it was probably find it on YouTube mayhem in the studio. There were kids crying. There were kids laying on the floor. They were tantruming all over the studio. These same kids that 15 minutes before were happy, like managing their states. Kids were now completely bonkers and unhappy. 
And, and Phil had experts to talk about sometimes milk is not appropriate for some kids and that it can cause these behavior challenges. I know in the eighties, that was in the eighties. So, uh, and why we don't, you know, there's the milk industry and people don't want to talk about it because you want to be able to have your ice cream, right? But you can have your ice cream. It doesn't have to have dairy in it. Okay. So, uh, and your life can be better. My mom was so upset when she would visit and she would say, uh, you know, are you never going to let him have dairy? And one time she, she, when I wasn't looking, she put a scoop of a little spoonful of ice cream into his mouth, which he promptly spit out because he didn't like cold stuff. And um, sensory wise, he just didn't like it. But she, and I said, what are you doing, mom? You know, he's not on dairy. She said, I just think it's a terrible life for him to never have ice cream. Like what kind of a life is he going to have, Shannon? And I said, okay, if that's how you feel, here's the thing. Let's go right now. We'll get him some ice cream. You can see he doesn't like it. He spits it out. But let, if that's how you feel, let's go get him some ice cream, mom, because I don't want you to be upset about his terrible life. But I just need you to know you're here for two weeks. He probably won't be able to speak for the rest of the two weeks. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, he will be dealing with all of the symptoms from the milk, mom. He won't be able to access language. We fought so hard to get him language. But if it's more important to you that he eat ice cream, let's, let's go do it. And she said, he really probably won't be able to speak. And I said, yeah, yeah. And she said, oh, well, for corn's sake, then we're not doing that. Right? Um, because it's a trade-off. You can't have everything always. Right. Um, and, and Steph says, uh, yes, very colicky as a baby. And a lot of parents go through that terrible time when they're breastfeeding and their babies are colicky. And it's that horrible. I had a friend who went through this. It's so traumatic for the mom. She was trying everything and, and the mom had to eliminate garlic and all these things. And the baby was still colicky. And they finally said to her, as much as we tell you, we want you to, your child is not reacting well to breast milk. So let's take him off of it and let's put him on an alternative. And then suddenly that baby was so much healthier and the mom was so much healthier, but it, mentally it was traumatic for her. It was like all these other women, you know, their child can handle it, but you know, we get the child that we get. Um, and Tabitha says, I wonder if it's a correlation between allergies and autism. Um, we were told our daughter's autism is environmental. Well, that's really interesting. Um, we know that there is an environmental component. And we know that what people can handle in terms of insults to their body is different. So that we know. And, and there are a lot of people, the, the current growing school of thought is that um, what happens with autism is that parts of the brain grow at a different speed than we see in kids who don't have autism, and that that is a reaction to something immunological. Immunological? Is that even a word? Um, and your daughter was highly allergic to formula and the milk that we gave to her. That was me as a child. That was absolutely me as a child. Um, and it can be hard, but we're going to talk about what you do in its stead and what the benefits are if you're willing to look at the food in a different way. Let's start with the gluten and the dairy thing. And I'm going to start, I'm really going to spend a little bit more time on the gluten and dairy thing only because of the diets that are there, it's sort of the one of the first, I think most of the experts in nutrition about autism say now, they will say to you, it doesn't work for everybody. Let's just be clear that everybody doesn't get this big result from a gluten-free, casein-free diet, but enough kids do that if your child is struggling, and and I mean in all different kinds of arenas, if your child is not speaking, if you're, if you're having behavior issues, if your child is showing like they're rocking and pushing against their stomach, they're showing any kind of gastrointestinal distress, this is where we would start. It's easier to do this. It's not as expensive as it used to be. And you can do it without upsetting the child's routine pretty easily now. Uh, and I say that knowing that it's not I wouldn't say easy is the word, but it's infinitely possible without pulling a hamstring. How's that? Okay. But why? People like to go, but why? Why you got such a, a thing about dairy and gluten? What's the problem with this? 
Uh, okay, so I, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version of this, and then you can feel free to go up and go out and look at all the things. Cause I've been to too many conferences where they put up slides. I was going to do this too, but I can't, I literally can't do it. Um, but they put up slides of peptides and they show you a peptide of a gluten. So it's this strand, it's the microscope and it shows all the different areas of it. And they show you milk and they show you uh, a peptide for opium. And it's very clear when you look at the slide that they're all kind of very close. If you were going to put a line of code up on the computer and you wanted to trick somebody by just changing a couple of letters, what you would do is put up a line of code of what is casein, what is, uh, which is the milk protein, what is gluten and what is opium. They're very close. And you go, well, that's interesting. Isn't that interesting? And there's even something called the opiate effect that they talk about with some kids with gluten and dairy, because your brain is filled with all these little receptors that are open, like picture little flowers that are like, oh, let's get some water. And the water driplets drip in and um, these receptors accept endorphins. And endorphins are the happy things when you're when you're feeling good, you get that runner's high or somebody says, I love you. And your brain triggers these endorphins and the endorphins come and they go into these receptors and your brain goes, I'm happy. Have you ever seen that that picture that they show of what it what happiness looks like? And it looks like a little two legged creature dragging this big ball. <laughs> and that, that that's literally what happens in your brain when happiness comes that the big ball goes into the receptor and it's like, oh, I feel good. That's the chemical understanding of it. But when your body doesn't process these proteins really well, what happens is it will pro it will process in a way that is closer to how you process opium. And when you have opium, what happens is uh, the opium, the chemical that's in the opium goes into those little receptors instead of the endorphins. So you get this buzz, you get this whoo, but you're not, it takes away some of your capabilities, your higher processing things, your ability to concentrate, your ability to focus on things, right? So, and it also, also takes away your ability to absorb endor endorphins. So think about that. It'll give you that momentary buzz. This is why people get addicted to opium and it destroys their life because it gives that buzz. So you get that immediate reinforcer, but then it robs you of the ability to truly feel joy. How's that for the seventh ring of hell? So for some of our kids, that is how their body receives these proteins. And I think when you think about that, please go do your research and, and learn more about this. But now you know what to look for. You can Google opiate effect, gluten-free, casein-free, and they'll give you diagrams and they'll show you all these things about it. But when you start to understand, wait a second, I love giving my child chicken nuggets and, and a big old glass of milk because it reminds me of my childhood. But am I is that, is it doing for my child what I want it to do for my child? Or is it literally robbing them of their ability to focus and feel joy? Woo, then we're talking about a different thing. Then you get a little motivated, right? Lori says, my son used to drink a gallon of milk a day. The pediatrician said two cups, only two cups a day. We cut it down, but haven't seen a change. We cut out sugars and dyed foods and it worked a little bit, but we also went from white bread to wheat and it's been better as well. Okay. And, and I think that all of those things, if we're talking about, you know, I think the general population, um, all of those things have the potential to help a lot because when you think about milk, um, milk is a protein, but um, here's what I always say to parents. When you look at what is the thing that your child eats compulsively? Like, you know, is it a child who just drinks a gallon of milk a day? And we would, we would go, okay, that's a little outside the norm, right? Um, that's, that's, you have a big preference for milk when you're drinking a, a gallon of milk a day. Um, you must really like it, right? Uh, or the kids who will only eat white foods or the kids who will only eat carbs or the kids who will only eat yellow things or whatever it is. Whatever the thing is that they're doing compulsively is probably the thing that's causing them more problems than anything else.
I know. Everybody just decided they hated me collectively. Could you hear it? I heard it. Everybody went, nope, I don't hear that, Shannon. But if they're doing something over and over, the kid that only eats uh, mac and cheese, the kid that only eats a grilled cheese, or, or that's the category. It's like bread and cheese in some way. You know, it's a carb and cheese. You that is probably the kid that stands to gain the most from going on a gluten-free casein-free diet. And by the way, he can have mac and cheese and he can have uh, grilled cheese. He can have all of those things. We're just going to change the ingredients on them. Um, Tabitha says my kid only wants carbs or vegetables, but that's okay because they're, they're liking the vegetables. What we want to do is get our kids to the point where they're healthy. And for every kid, that's going to be a different, um, strategy and it's going to be a different balance, right? But the thing that I would always go off of is that as we're looking as a plate at a plate, we want to balance it, right? That's the promised land of where we want to get to, where every single single meal, meal our child is able to have a carb they can handle, a vegetable that they can handle, a protein that they can handle, and then throughout their day, we need to get some fruit in there as well, right? And by the way, they've got to have some fats uh, to be able to maintain health, right? That those are the things that are the basis of any healthy diet. But we find that some kids need more protein and a lot less carb. If they're having seizures, that might be the thing. And some kids are not going to be able to handle certain vegetables. Some aren't going to be able to handle certain fruits. But if you look at the typical diet of, say, a five-year-old in the United States, when I say to people, if you picture it on your plate, when I'm packing a lunch for years, when I would pack a lunch for my son, I would always think, okay, what's the carb? What's the vegetable? What's the, um, the protein? And do I want to include fruit? And what's the fat in there? And, and other parents would look at me and go, what is this thing you're talking about? But that's the basis of any diet. It's just that then playing with the levels of it to find you've done that as an adult for yourself or you're trying to right? Um, Carol says, my grandson is five years old and has autism. He only eats butter crackers and Capri Sun. Carol, I'm glad you're here because let's see if we can change that. Um, Tabitha says, my kid only wants to eat carbs or vegetables and cookies. And see, here's the thing. When we have kids, they're going to crave what they crave. And if you think about it, you know, if, if it didn't matter and if it didn't have any effect on you, what would you eat all day? <laughs> like, would it be chocolate cake? I'm horribly allergic to chocolate. So that would not be the thing for me. But what would you eat if you could eat it all day and it didn't have any effect on you? I would eat ice cream. I would specifically eat butter pecan ice cream. And there, and I will tell you in my adult life, you know, when I was in my 20s, there was probably a day where I only had butter pecan ice cream when I was in college. Where I was like, ah, I'm just going to have ice cream. You know, ah, I'm going to have ice cream. Um, right. But I paid the price for it and my stomach didn't feel well. And then I realized, well, you really can't do that. When you're a five-year-old, not even a five-year-old who's not on the spectrum is going to be able to make that choice for themselves. And we, because we love our kids, want to make them happy. And so we give, because food is a primary reinforcer, right? We give them the treats and the rewards and then we give them the cookie because that feels like love. It absolutely does. Uh, and we don't want to take it away from them. We don't, we don't ever want to take away the things that are reinforcing to them. That's just the basis of who we are, right? But as we begin to understand this and come up with some strategies for how do we get it to more balance, then, then I think you guys will start to see, oh, and my kid is able to focus more and my kid is able to, you know, learn things that they couldn't learn last week when we were eating this, that, or the other thing. Um, so, you know, it has a reinforcer when we don't always give them exactly what they want. Um, oh, Steph says, I find that sardines and broccoli works for my son, son, sometimes carrots. Great. And then if you, and then slowly add some other things into that, we always talk about eating the rainbow. Uh, Lori says, how do I get my son to eat veggies? He eats fruit like out of this world, but the veggies, oh boy, it's also a sensory disorder too. Yeah. Okay. So part of it is too, that our kids, you got to understand that their taste buds are bigger and more alive than ours. As we age, our taste buds die. 
And so we don't taste broccoli the same way they taste broccoli. Broccoli has a lot of acid in it. And some kids really like that. And other kids will be like, Ooh, it, you know, it's literally like burn their tongue kind of acid. So we want to make sure that first of all, we don't overcook vegetables. I find that a lot of kids will eat raw broccoli that won't eat overcooked broccoli because it's just too much acid in it. Um, and, uh, and, and yet there's, kids who love that, who crave that. So, but try as you're introducing vegetables to not overcook them. There's always that tendency that we want to, you know, and some of our kids don't like to chew, right? Uh, but try not to overcook them. The other thing is that I am a big believer in the sneak food in and don't let them know. There's been all kinds of research on this. Uh, is it Jessica Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld's wife that did the cookbook about, uh, I'm sure it's still available, how you can grind up vegetables and sneak them into food. I don't personally have that cookbook, but this is, this is what the scientists tell me it is like the most effective thing that when you're trying to get someone to try a new food, first of all, here's the statistic. I'm, I'm not sure that I'm going to get it exactly right, but it's something like you have to present a food like 26 times before they'll try it. And you don't make it a battle. Stop the battles. Stop the battles. So the first thing that I tell people to do is on a regular basis, if you're having trouble getting your child to um, eat vegetables, First of all, take them to the store, show, take them to the farmer's market, help them to pick out vegetables, talk about the vegetables, name the vegetables so that vegetables become a part of their existence. So they're not frightened by them. And you're not asking them to eat them at the grocery store. We're just like, oh, you know, this is, this is a pea and this is a carrot and, you know, we're labeling them and they become part of their life. They're not this big mystery, right? Grow them if you can. And then they, you know, then there's some natural curiosity there, right? Then whenever there, there are times in the day when your child is just hungrier than other times, right? It might be when they come home from school and they want a snack, or it might be that hour before dinner time when you're trying to make a meal and everybody's hungry, right? So that's a perfect time to cut up some raw vegetables and put them out. Hear me say this. This is not, you know, um, force them to eat them, but you put out a small plate of carrot sticks, right? Carrots are filled with natural sugar. And it's, it's, it tends to be, at least if kids like a crunch, if they don't like a crunch, you can steam them a little bit. Just don't overcook them, right? But you put it out and make it available because a hungry child will eat things that a non-hungry child won't eat. But don't harangue them about it. You put the vegetables out and you and then, and and if your child is showing signs that they're hungry or they're saying that they're hungry, you say, "Oh, well the carrots are there." And and they're going to be like, "I don't want a carrot. I want a cookie." Like, what is wrong with you? And for a child who doesn't have words, that's going to look like a tantrum, right? And and you just don't attend to it and you don't lecture it and you don't and you don't say you can't have the cookie you have to have the carrot it's not about that you're just making it available if you have a dog in the house it's great because whatever isn't eaten you can give to the dog my dog loves carrots. She would eat a pound of carrots a day if I let her. Um, you know what I'm saying? Or or later, if they don't eat it, then you grind it up to put in something. Now, I had a child who epically loved vegetables uh, because I always gave them to him. Um, and I, I didn't have to start when he was three. He had vegetables all along. I would take him to a restaurant and that baby would scarf down vegetables and people in the restaurant would come over and go, this is a magic trick. How do you do this? Because he'd always had vegetables. Um, and he was hungry. You know what I'm saying? Um, and sometimes you gotta, like, it's important to give kids regular snacks so we don't make them starving, right? But it's not, it, it's also important to not over snack them so that they come to meals and they're like, oh, I'll hold up the cookie, right? Um, but the other, so the other thing that, that I had to deal with was I married a man who hadn't had a vegetable in 10 years, except if it was sausage and pepper sandwich. Okay. And my husband would need a carrot or a piece of broccoli if you paid him. So what I would do is I would make meatloaf and I would take carrots and broccoli and I would steam them and put them into my food processor and grind them until, you know, they were basically, you know, a, a very chunky liquid, but not too chunky. Like really, I really ground it down to almost a liquid. And then instead of putting 
breadcrumbs and cheese and all of those things into the meatloaf, I would just take turkey meat, ground turkey, and I would put the broccoli and the carrots in and I would put salt and pepper. That's it. That's it. And I wouldn't put anything else in. And then I would bake it like you bake a meatloaf. And then afterwards, I would take some tomato sauce and put it across the top, right? And I would serve it. And I wouldn't tell anybody what was happening. And my husband would eat it like there was no tomorrow. Now, in the beginning, I followed the science. And in the beginning, with, with our kids that are fussy, read my husband, but also kids that are fussy, they've done lots of research on this. You don't put a lot of carrots and broccoli in. Maybe you put a cup of carrots and broccoli in, right? But then gradually over time, what happens is you increase it a little bit at a time. And if you find that they turn their nose up, up at it, you go, okay, I gotta, I gotta walk it back and put less broccoli and carrots in. And I would also, by the way, put broccoli and carrots on the plate. My husband wouldn't eat it. He would be like, honey, why'd you put it on the plate? You know, I don't eat that. You know, I don't like that. And I go, I know, babe. So how was the meatloaf? Oh my God, that meatloaf is great. Like I've never tasted meatloaf like that. It's so great. It's so moist. Oh my God, your meatloaf is amazing, honey. I want seconds, right? And I and I wouldn't make a fuss with my husband about the broccoli and the carrots on the plate. You know, uh, I would eat it. My son would eat it or the dogs would eat it, whatever. Uh, but this is the exact way that the food experts talk about giving our children. Because what you do is you're giving them an introduction to the taste of it without all the emotional stuff of, ah, oh, it's a carrot. I don't eat, eat carrots. And it's paired with something that they like, which, which in that case was the meat. You can put it with all kinds of things. Jessica Seinfeld has uh, a cookbook about how to make chicken nuggets that are coated in broccoli. I just don't even know. Do you know what I mean? Uh, Steph says spinach is good. You can't taste it. Abs now, do you know how I make meatballs? I was telling this to Trayvon the other day. Uh, I don't put cheese and breadcrumbs and meatballs. I grind up spinach and I have people over and they go, my God, these meatballs are so good. What did you put in them? Spinach. <laughs> people who will not eat a vegetable. Um, so, and, and what it does is it removes the battle because we don't need to be battling with our kids at the dinner table about vegetables. You present a vegetable on the side, you don't coerce, but you're introducing their taste buds to the vegetable without them knowing it. And there's a whole bunch more interventions, but that's the one that I find easy peasy. Um, and Tabitha says, we introduce vegetables by growing them. I think when kids understand what vegetables are, um, they, they have a natural curiosity. And you can grow a bean plant really easily. Uh, she says, I think she likes the crunchiness of it. She has sensory issues also. Uh, she, oh, I see. Uh, my kiddo won't do the cooked vegetables. But that's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids. But that's why I say put those fresh veggies out. Don't do celery. Well, some kids like celery, but some kids don't. But carrots are a pretty popular thing. Um, and if you need to, a lot of, I see a lot of kids who are like, oh, I like my carrots with my ranch dressing, then get a really healthy one. And you can even get a dairy free one. I'm just saying, uh, <laughs> you can do that if you're avoiding dairy and then they get their little treat with their little carrots. You can even get them. They, you know, um, they sell little packets that they can take in their lunch. Uh, it's a much better thing. That's a way that you can start to take control. But so going back to the, what's the gluten in the dairy thing, I think that this is worth a college try, but here's what I want you to know about this. If you do the gluten and casein-free diet, it's so much easier. I'm going to give you like my top products that I absolutely love for gluten and dairy-free diet. But a lot of people don't get that. Well, you know, so we'll go gluten and, and dairy-free for breakfast. And then they go, and then we, you know, it was a little expensive and it was a little inconvenient. We weren't seeing any bang for our buck. That's because you didn't do it right. If you're going to go gluten and casein free and you want to see if there is a result, then you really got to give at least a six month thing of saying we are not going to have an infraction. And, and if that means that you throw away your toaster and you only have gluten free bread in the house or you buy a second toaster because you don't want to cross contaminate or, you know, it, it does mean you're going to have to a little bit of a lifestyle change, but I think it's worth it to do to give it the college try of at least six months. 
I I have a dear friend whose child was gluten free and they learned all these skills and they were doing so well and they got to be school aged and the parents said, we just think that there's going to be stigma attached to this. We want them to be able to go to birthday parties and have birthday cake. So, you know, we're, we're just, we're, you know, we're taking them off the gluten free diet. And almost immediately they saw behavior changes and they were like, we don't know what to do because we're seeing behavior we haven't seen in a long time. And we all said, do you think it maybe it's the gluten and the dairy? And they just were like, no, no, it really isn't. We've seen absolutely no change, but we're having all of this behavior. Try to be honest with yourselves. The food thing is tricky because we all want our kids, but you know what? My kid can have birthday cake. Now there were a lot of years and he has gluten-free, dairy-free Woo, cake, right? And it looks great and it tastes great. And, you know, it's wonderful. I'm going to give you the cake mix that you can get that's off the chart. Fabulous. Um, he can have it now, but there were a lot of years that he went to birthday parties and he didn't have cake and everybody felt so horrible for him. And, you know, he's in college and he's talking and, and it's like, well, you know, we all have our crosses to bear, right? He's okay. He survived it. Uh, everybody feels so bad for him. Uh, and, you know, I don't. Uh, oh, Steph says, my daughter just recently started eating lettuce roll-ups. Oh, my son loves to go to P.F. Chang's and get the lettuce wraps. Ooh, that's good stuff. And they make a gluten-free one. Ask for the gluten-free one because, you know, uh, there's gluten in soy sauce. But you can get tamari sauce, which does not have gluten in it. Okay. But if you're going to do the gluten-free, dairy-free thing, do the gluten-free, dairy-free thing. Oh, this is so hard to read. This is terrible. We're going to make this PowerPoint available to you. But here are some of my favorite things. And I put the links here so that when you get the PowerPoint, you can use it. But I can tell you what they are. The first one, there's a company called Breads from Anna. Oh, we love Anna. Anna is a real person in Iowa. I've met Anna. I've interviewed Anna. Um, and she makes a line of mixes that are gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free. And most of them are also sugar-free. And I know it sounds like they couldn't possibly be good. Oh, my friends, you're going to want to know Anna. Um, she makes a pumpkin bread mix and a banana bread mix that is off the chart. Best thing I have ever had gluten-free or non-gluten-free. I make these for the holidays and share them with people who don't know about gluten-free, uh, who say, this is amazing. You have to give me the recipe to it. Right. Fan freaking tastic. I give them now as gifts at the holiday time to people that I know that are gluten-free because it's absolutely off the chart. And then recently for the 4th of July, there, she has a black bean brownie mix that I got and I'd been saving it. I made it for the 4th of July and, uh, you know, they encourage you to put mix-ins and I put the Enjoy Life chocolate chip, dairy-free, gluten-free chocolate, mini chocolate chips in it. And I put um, gluten-free, dairy-free marshmallows in it at, for the 4th of July and took them over to the Asner's house for their 4th of July thing. And Matt Asner will tell you, he was like, this is amazing. A black bean and, and you had to add a can of black beans that, you know, I used organic ones and I rinsed them really well. And then you process them in the, the processor and put it in there. So it was like this incredibly healthy chocolate gooeyness of loveliness. Um, Anna, you know, is your new best friend. Breads from Anna. They sell them in some stores. I just order directly from them and have them. And I have I get cases delivered because it's that good. The next one on the list, I promised you that I was going to give you the cake recipe. So King Arthur Baking makes a yellow cake mix uh, that is unbelievable. It is moist. It is fabulous. It is. And, and, you know, the truth is you don't even have to frost it because it's that good, but you can get many frostings now. Um, there's the Miss Jones frosting that you can get that's dairy-free, gluten-free. Um, and it's not bad. I've tried making my own frosting, you know, using a, a dairy, a vegan butter substitute and uh, powdered sugar. You can do it. You can add colors to it, but we'll talk about why you should use natural ones in a minute. But anyway, this, I, I used to always be, I was in charge of making Wyatt's birthday cakes for Nancy. And I made some pretty 
earth shattering, uh, if I do say so myself, birthday cakes for him. This is a great cake mix. I make sure that I have a couple of them in my cabinet always so that if I have to make cupcakes or cake or whatever, it's absolutely fabulous. I will tell you it's hard to come by because people snap them up and buy them. Their chocolate cake mix is almost available everywhere you go. And I have to say, I've not yet tried the chocolate cake mix, but the vanilla cake mix is off the chart. Fabulous. Best thing I've ever found. Okay. The next thing on the list is Purdue makes a uh, gluten-free organic chicken strips. And they also make the ones that are frozen that are a little bit more available right now, gluten-free chicken nuggets that are frozen. And those are great too, but I'm telling you these organic chicken strips are the best thing going. They're hard to find right now, which is why I've given you the SKU number on the screen. The SKU number is 727-450-0143. I called the Purdue company yesterday because we've been having trouble finding them. They sell out of stores and, and they're hard to find. And, and they said, okay, you know, you got to talk to your store manager and tell them to order more. You're going to need the SKU. So any place that, any store that you go to, this is our regular grocery store that was selling them, but I can't get them. They're sold out all the time because they're freaking fabulous. And I have my two grandnieces that are not gluten-free that eat a very typical American kid diet. And whenever they would come to our house, they would have the chicken strips. And then when I would come to their house, I would buy them. And my niece always says to me, oh, you and those, she has to stock them now in her house because they absolutely love them. They're, they're just really good. Um, they taste good and they're organic, super healthy. Um, Yes. And, and I want to say for all of these products here, um, the, none of this is an advertisement. I've not been paid to say any of this, but all of these companies should know we'd be happy to regularly feature them and put ads on the show because I love, love, love these products. These are my like piece de resistance of the gluten-free, dairy-free. Of course, there would be no list that I could do with this without uh, including Daya products on it. And we love, love, love their, and have for years, their mac and cheese. It's, you know, it comes in a box, you guys, just like what you've been used to your whole life. It is more expensive. It's worth it. It tastes better and it's not going to give your kid a tummy ache and your kid is not going to know the difference. Um, it's so good and yummy and delicious. And they make different, they make a white sauce one, an Alfredo sauce one. There's the cheddar one. There's one now that has a vegan bacon in it. Um, so there's, there's one that even has little vegetables in it. Um, they're all good. We especially love the, the classic mac and cheese one. And Daya makes a line of salad dressings. They make a ranch dressing. They make a blue cheese dressing, dairy-free, y'all. And it's pretty fabulous. So uh, they also make sliced cheese, too, that you can do. And, the, and we have their shredded cheese to put on everything. They make a shredded cheddar. They make a sh shredded mozzarella, you know, that we use really well. But I am going to say that my new favorite mozzarella is the next one, which is the Mykonos Horrible Mozzarella. I it, like it is the craziest thing. You buy it in a little thing. It looks like a little container of cream and you shake it up and you pour it on top of something and you, and it's liquid. It's just liquid, not like anything you've ever seen before. And you pop it in the oven. And when you're making a pizza, whoo, it is stretchable. It melts better than any other dairy-free cheese. Uh, if you're if you're making something like a lasagna or something like that, it's off the charts. And no one knows. No one knows. It's it's like a magic trick. Um, okay, and then the next one, oh, well, Canyon House, Canyon Bakehouse breads. We've loved them for a really long time. When you guys are looking for a soft bread that you don't have to toast, that you want to make a sandwich. There's so many good gluten-free breads out there now, really good gluten-free breads. But a lot of you have said, what's the one that you don't have to toast? Now, you can toast the, the Canyon Bakehouse breads, and they're fabulous, but you don't have to. You can put whatever you want in there, put it in the school lunch. No one will know. It's so good. It's like a little compulsive for me. I want to eat like, it's just like, I haven't had soft bread like this ever. Um, and our particular favorite right now is their Hawaiian 
whoo, it's got, it's got a little sweetness to it. That's some good stuff right there, you guys. So you get me talking about food. And then our last one that I super love that I keep stocked in my pantry is there's a, there's a company called Scar, C-H-A-R with that umlaut over the A. And they make a line of breads that are great because I, I love them. They come vacuum sealed. They have a baguette that I just packed my son, uh, um, a roast beef sandwich on one of those because it looks like a submarine, a hoagie. Love, love, love theirs. But it's a crustier bread. You know what I'm saying? But they, the thing that I really love from them is they make a pizza crust and it comes vacuum sealed. So it doesn't have to take up space in my refrigerator. I put it in the pantry. They're good for months. They're, they come two to a package and I come home some nights and it's like, you know, my son cooks a lot of his own meals now, but he'll say, mom, I'm really hungry. Do we have anything. And I go, let me make you a pizza. And you know what I do? I take the scissors. I cut that sucker open. I pull it out. I throw it on the cookie sheet. I put some sauce on it. I put whatever meats that he has that he likes. And I pour that Mykonos uh, Miyako's, I don't know how you say that. And I pop it in the oven and it's in there for 10 minutes. And he's got this ooey gooey, fabulous gluten-free pizza. And it didn't cost me a fortune and it's stuff that I could keep in, in the pantry. It's fabulous. So I absolutely, absolutely love, uh, that product. Uh, okay. So those are some of my favorites, but I have millions more, but that's just to give you an idea of some really good, because sometimes people go, Oh, you know, I bought something that was gluten-free and it tasted like an asbestos tile. You don't have to do that anymore. There's some really good stuff out there. Uh, okay. Uh, where do I get things that are gluten-free? And again, this is not an advertisement. None of these people advertise with us, but they should. Um, these are some of the places that I buy. Costco has some of the best gluten-free stuff and vegan stuff that doesn't have um, the dairy in it. Oof, I, I buy specific things. I have a membership to Thrive Online. I encourage you to look at that. I do buy stuff at Whole Foods. I buy a lot of stuff at Sprouts. I love Sprouts. Sprouts has regular sales on gluten-free stuff, and I stock up, stock up. Uh, Trader Joe's, I just joined a Facebook group the other day for all the gluten-free products that are at Trader Joe's. And, and Rachel Bird, who's going to be joining us to start a show with us, she has turned me on to a lot of gluten-free things at Trader Joe's. Love, love, love it. But your local grocery store and my local grocery store carry more now than they ever did before. When I used to visit family in Iowa, and I would go there and I'd be like, well, how, how am I going to survive? How is my child going to survive? And I went to the local grocery store and I was like, wow. These, these guys have more because there's so many celiac people out there and so many people that have gone vegan or at least dairy free. Your local grocery store is going to carry a lot of these things and get to know the manager of your local store and ask them for things like show them that scoot for that those Purdue chicken strips. That's some good stuff right there. Um, that's a happy, happy meal. Okay. Uh, but but the GFCF is not the only thing that I want to talk about um, because there's three big things that I think now, even before I tell people to try, try the GFCF, I tell them to take a look at these three lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. Um, pesticides, artificial colors, and artificial flavors. We know, and we have known since 2011, the first study came out that said the amount of pesticide in a child's body, this, the pesticide lo load is directly correlated to the amount of behaviors that we will see that will be about, that will be things that will be ADHD, like lack of focus, uh, inability to focus. We know that. That we saw the first study in 2011, and more and more studies have piled on there to say that the pesticides do not belong in our children's bodies. Hey, guess what? Here's a duh. They don't belong in any of our bodies. Um, and I know it's hard to know. So the thing that I want to introduce you to is it's a thing called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. You can go to, and I, I don't know if I put this on the, the PowerPoint, but there's there's something called Environmental Working Group. So I think it's EWG. It might just be EW.org. And it's a website that just gives you information about what ingredients are in things. Like if you're concerned about what beauty products, they have a whole division that's beauty products. Um, but yearly, they put out something called the the, the Dirty Dozen. Uh, is it the, so it's the 
is it the dirty dozen in the clean 15? That's what it is. The dirty dozen in the clean 15. You can just Google that. Lots of websites carry it from their site. And every year they update it. They do research to say what produce wise, what, what's the worst? What's the worst stuff out there that if that we want you to know, don't ever this year, don't eat that and don't have your child eat it. It's got, they dumped pesticide on it. And it, and it is yearly because there'll be an infestation of bugs. And, and maybe, you know, I put it, I put a picture of apples because a couple of years ago it was apples. Apple crops have been attacked and everybody was dumping pesticides on the apples. Think about the applesauce that, uh, and the apple juice that we're giving our kids. And we were unknowingly giving them stuff that was making it harder for them to focus. They literally could, you know, the child would eat something and they would test to see what the pesticide load was. Then they would watch the child's behavior and then the child would pee and they would look in the pesticide residue is in the pee and, and you could chart it exactly by how much uh, the, the behavior, by how much pesticide, the more pesticide, the more of those ADHD-like behaviors. What do we say all the time? We want our children to be able to focus. Oh my gosh. And, and there's a reason why they can't focus. What we know about pesticides is going to tweak you guys all out. I know we're way past time driven, but I'm going to continue on. We know that there's something called organophosphates that are in pesticides and we're trying to get them eliminated, but they are neurotransmitter disruptors. This is literally, I used to think, well, pesticide is to kill bugs. They don't kill humans. We're not dying. So how bad could it be? Right? That was my school of thought. Then I read this study in 2011 and I went, oh my gosh, pesticides don't kill bugs. They they disrupt their neurotransmitters, the, how their nervous system takes from their brain to their legs and communicates with them. So a certain amount of pesticide and what it does is it causes the bugs not to be able to focus so they don't eat and they eventually starve to death. Guess what? If they pile a lot of that pesticide on, it gets to the point where the, 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 the bugs legs move compulsively and they can't stop it. So much so that they die moving without being able to stop themselves. That's how much their lack of focus is. They can't even stop themselves. That's what a neurotransmitter does to a bug. If you're not concerned about what it might be doing to your child, look at some of the studies. Because people say, oh, it's a neurotransmitter for bugs. It doesn't have anything to do with our kids. Then why is there a direct correlation between ADHD-like behaviors where the child is not focusing and the amount of pesticides in their blood, in their urine? Uh, for me, I, I know it's just like you go, what? I'm going to get rid of the pesticides as much as I can. If you look at that clean 15 and the dirty dozen, you'll know which things that you really got to be mindful of and which things aren't being sprayed with pesticide that you can get conventionally and pay the cheaper price. I will tell you that you almost can figure it out without the list when you go to the store, when you see the organic thing and the non-organic thing right next to each other. If there's like a 10, 15 cent difference between the two of them, it's probably on the clean list. It probably doesn't matter. When it's $5 more for the one that's organic, it's probably because the non-organic one is bathed in pesticide. But if you're trying to help your child to be able the focus, please investigate going as organic as you possibly can. But then let's talk for just a second about the artificial colors and the artificial flavors. Because in the United States, this is just rampant. You wouldn't even believe the things that they put artificial color and flavor in that our kids will, will eat. Um, it's, and it's, it's mind blowing once you start to look at it and it's not good. They don't do it in other countries. They've outlawed it in other countries. Um, I, I remember being a teenager and somebody bringing me M&Ms from Israel. A friend who had visited Israel came back and, and, and we were talking about how the colors were different. How come? Well, the colors are different in, can, uh, in candy in Europe and in other countries because they don't allow for some of the things that we're allowing to go into our children's candy. And, and it's not good for them. And, it, and we see that it does cause tantrums and meltdowns and in some cases seizures. So 
I really want to encourage everybody to get your child as artificial color and flavor free as possible. It might mean that their favorite candy is now off the table, but there are candies and companies that make candies that are, don't have artificial colors and flavors in them. They're super. I love Yum Earth. Again, not a commercial, but they should be advertising with us. Um, love their candies and they're super tasty and kids love them. Nobody turns up their nose when you give them a yum candy lollipop. They absolutely love them and there's nothing bad in it for them. Uh, and the more we as consumers buy those products, the more of those kinds of products are on the market. Now, some of you might be going, but Halloween is coming and Christmas is coming and we love our red whatever. And red is one of the big offenders, man, that red dye, whatever the number is, whoo. That causes some tan trums in some of our kids, right? Um, and you're like, I just can't get through Halloween. My, how am I going to explain this to my kid that they're not going to be able to eat all of their candy? I, I got another thing for you is that it, eventually we encourage you to really limit refined sugar. We see that that disrupts focus. And when you can have refined sugar, you don't want everything else. When you take refined sugar out of a kid's diet slowly, not cold turkey, suddenly they want to eat the carrot. You know why? Because the carrot has the natural sugar in it. Um, so I really want to encourage you to look at candy and sugar, especially because of the artificial colors and flavors, but also because of the sugar in a different way. Uh, because everybody in my family runs diabetic, we were warned when our child was born, I, I had gestational diabetes and he was over 10 pounds. And my pediatrician sat me down and said, you got to be really careful or this kid is going to have juvenile diabetes. He's prone to it because of your family history and because the fact that you had gestational diabetes more prone to it than a typical kid. I'm so grateful that my pediatrician said that to me because he said no juice for this kid. He said, if you absolutely have to give him juice, you're going to water it down. Never give that kid hundred percent juice. It, so if you have to put it in a sippy cup, cause you feel like he's missing out on the vitamin C, give him the whole thing. But if you have to put a little bit of juice in the bottom and fill the rest with water, um, and we, I took that real hard because I did not want him to be insulin dependent. So when Halloween rolled around, we were like, what are we going to do? And of course my kid was on the spectrum. He didn't understand Halloween. He didn't get the whole thing. We started early, but I've seen people do this later on with other kids where they make a deal with them. Now we had the Lego fairy. You can, I know people who have the Barbie fairy. You can have the, you know, uh, Paw Patrol fairy. I don't care. Or, you know, make something up for yourselves. But we had the Lego fairy and we told our son, you're going to go trick or treating and people are going to give you candy in your bucket and, th and this is a great thing. And he was like, but I don't eat candy. He didn't even know what it tasted like. Your kids do. Um, but what we said to him is you have a choice. You can keep that or you can put it on the dining room table and leave it for the Lego fairy who loves candy. And the Lego fairy will trade you your candy for a Lego. And my son was like, well, I want a Lego, right? Um, it's got to be a big enough reinforcer that they're willing. And maybe you don't trade all the candy. Maybe you, everybody, good parents, you look at the candy and you sort out, you can't have that. It's not wrapped, right? We're willing to say that. What if you were to say, we're going to sort through all of the candy and we're going to take out everything that has artificial colors and flavors. And then the stuff that's left, we're going to ration it so you can have a little bit every day. But the stuff that we took out, we're going to leave that for the Barbie fairy, or we're going to leave that for the Paw Patrol fairy, fairy or the Lego fairy. The Lego fairy worked for me for years. So just don't be tied to you know, it's not going to be fun for them if they can't have the sugar. That is a lie that our childhood is telling us, right? There's lots of fun to be had with no sugar, even for our kids who love sugar. I just had nieces visit and one of them was like, when are you going to get me candy? And I, she had a great time and we did not get candy. Just saying. Okay. So I've given you some resources here of places where you can find out more information. If anything that I've said, you're like, I want to know more about that. I want to know more about that oxalate diet. I want to know more about, you know, these, these different things. So, um, 
I gave you uh, some research uh, from autism.org about implementing special diets. Obviously, I included TACA, T-A-C-A now.org. They have more information about these special diets than any other 12 websites put together. Um, and they have people, mentors who will help you if you have questions as well. Uh, so I gave you two different sites from them. And I also wanted, I gave you the link to the playlist of where we have recipes that Lisa Ackerman from TACA has done with us and for us, some of her favorite recipes of how she uh, fed her son, there's the alarm, um, that uh, are gluten-free, casein-free, and I think all soy-free as well. And it's some amazing stuff. For those of you who are like, how am I going to pack the lunchbox? Watch some of those recipes. Uh, it all. Listen, I've tasted it all. It's all amazing. So um, I hope that this opens your mind a little bit more to the fact that there is stuff available to you, but it's a little bit like doing a science project, right? That your child's ecosystem is, it, it's not one size fits all, right? Your child's ecosystem is unique and special, and you're going to want to do some experimentation with them and for yourself about what they like and how does their body respond well to it. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to do. I, I know it was for us. My son was one of those kids that, you know, he had been speaking, he lost language. And, and how I came to all of this was that uh, when he was being evaluated to start services with an OT, I said to that OT, I said, what can I do? I feel so helpless. What can I possibly do that would help him right now? And she said, well, you know, there's some people who believe in the diets. She goes, I don't really, but you know, there's some people who believe in it. And I said, what diets? And she said, oh, you know, the gluten-free diet. She didn't even say casein-free. And since I was allergic to wheat, I was like, I didn't even know what gluten was. And I said, what do you mean gluten? She goes, oh, you know, it's in wheat. And I said, wheat? I'm allergic to wheat. So we went all in and removed wheat from his diet that day. Um, and I saw an immediate change in him and he started to be more receptive to learning words. And then the next week somebody said, oh, well, aren't you removing the milk too? Milk, didn't know about that. I'm a, I'm, I was allergic to milk as a child. So then we eliminated that and the tantrums almost completely went away. And I went, okay, I have found a lane that we can be in. Even now, my son is 19. He's gluten-free and casein-free, but he regularly challenges. He, you know, he goes out to dinner now with his friends and we were out to dinner with him the other day and he's really gotten into goat cheese. He's discovered that his body can handle goat cheese and he loves it. But he got goat cheese on a salad and didn't know that it was going to come breaded. And it came bread and he was like, well, you know, it looks like a challenge kind of day. He's a 19 year old. He can decide that for himself. And you know what he said to me the next day? Yeah, I don't like the way my stomach feels, but I think it was the wheat, not the goat cheese. Uh, he's an adult like everybody else. He's discovering like my aunt did. I like onions, but onions don't like me. Um, Look, Rainbow Mo shows here with us. Nutrition is key for our kids on the autism spectrum. Rainbow benefited immensely from the nutritional changes made at home. See, I, it, and it's not just an autism thing, you guys. It's not. It's This is important for all of us that we be mindful and go, how is this affecting this individual? I just think with autism, it's sometimes that much more important because your regular physicians aren't going to look for it. They're just not. So I hope this helps you. Please write in with any questions that you have. We're going to end the show now. We are back tomorrow with Nancy Allspot Jackson and a fabulous dad uh, who discovered when he was sending his child to school that there was a way that he could petition his insurance to get them to cover ABA for their child in the classroom at school. So, you know. You guys are always asking, how do we get the aid? And you fight with the school for it and the school doesn't want to do it. Maybe the insurance company can. You're not going to want to miss that. Plus, she'll give us an update on why art. And we'll do some in the news and have some other stuff. I do want to say before we leave, I want to ask if anybody is watching Extraordinary Attorney Woo. It is the number one show in Korea right now. And it is... Kind of like the, if I'm calling it the Korean version of the good doctor, only the main character is a girl 
and she is on the spectrum and she's an attorney and it is there's some lovely writing in it you guys highly recommend you give it a, a check we're going to be reviewing it on the next let's talk movies with moira and shannon so uh but check it out all right we'll be back tomorrow until then give your kiddos a hug from me and a carrot and one for you as well bye bye for now If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.